Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. U.S. indirectly funding Afghan warlords. Kurdish rebels behind military bus blasts that killed five in Istanbul. And despite Israeli warnings, Lebanese aid ships sail to Gaza. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. إلى هذه النشرة ومن العناوين إلى تفاصيلها فقد قالت الحكومة الأفغانية إن الأمم المتحدة The Afghan government has said that the United Nations will gradually remove the names of Taliban members who do not have links to Al-Qaeda from its blacklist. President Hamid Karzai's office said that the president demanded delegations from UN Security Council member countries to take Taliban members off the blacklist and that the delegations agreed to gradually remove the members who are not linked to Al-Qaeda or other terrorist organizations. خلص تقرير للجنة الأمن القومي في الكونغرس الأمريكي The U.S. Congress's Security Committee concluded in a report that money allocated by the Department of Defense to protect U.S. troops in Afghanistan is not any kind of bribery. The money was paid to warlords in Afghanistan in exchange for their protection of American convoys. الكونغرس الأمريكي يمول الميليشيات الأفغانية بشكل غير مباشر. The U.S. Congress is indirectly sponsoring the Afghan militias. This was revealed by a report from the Congress's Security Committee. The report was compiled following investigations conducted by the Security Committee. It indicates that the United States pays millions of dollars to the leaders of Afghan militias, maybe to the Taliban as well, to secure supply convoys and assure that they safely reach U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The Pentagon hires specialized companies for transporting supplies in Afghanistan, and it is up to to those companies to choose how to provide security for themselves and their convoys. This arrangement gave way to the formation of a wide-ranging protection network administered by leaders of secret militias, armed men, and corrupt Afghan officials and leaders. Members of the Security Committee believe that the current policy itself of securing supply transportation to the U.S. Army is ruining the strategic efforts of the U.S. in Afghanistan. One of the consequences of this policy is undermining U.S. efforts to grapple with corruption and form an efficient Afghan government. I came to Marjar with my team, members of the Department of State, the Homeland Security Committee, and the Department of Defense and Intelligence. We came here because it's high time to get a direct report on our strategy. The report described the money paid to provide protection as a potentially important source of Taliban sponsorship. It indicated that several documents, reports from eyewitnesses and emails pointed to the Taliban's attempt to seize that money at one point. Investigators began their inquiry after reviewing a contract of nearly $2 million in November 2009. The contract the contract stipulated that only 70 percent of that figure covers the costs of supplies and ammunition for U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Faiza Harzala, Al Arabiya. قال وزير الدفاع الأمريكي روبرت جيتس إن تصريح ماك كريستل إلى أحد الصحف هو خطأ. U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said that McChrystal's statements to a newspaper were a big mistake. The commander of U.S. and NATO troops in Afghanistan, General Stanley McChrystal, called Washington to clarify the controversial comments that criticized President Barack Obama's administration. تأتي هذه الخطوة بعد يوم من اعتذار ماك كريستل عن تعليقات مساعدي. This came one day after McChrystal apologized for his assistance comments, which were denounced by a number of Obama's advisors. The comments will be published in an article in Rolling Stone magazine this coming Friday. McChrystal said that he apologizes for these comments, which were wrong and reflected poor judgment. Armed men from the Kurdistan Workers' Party threatened to and then carried out the bombing of a bus carrying military personnel in the Turkish city of Istanbul, killing five people, including four soldiers and a child. The bombing coincided with Turkey's preparation to squash the Kurdish rebels' activities, which have been escalating in the past several days. 
The bombing took place in Istanbul, Turkey's commercial and tourist center, one day after Kurdish fighters threatened to carry out their operations in Turkish cities. The bombing targeted a bus that carried military personnel in the Turkish army. An explosive device was planted on the bus route and was detonated by remote control from the suburb of Halkia as the bus was approaching the site. The bombing also took place one day after the Turkish commandos started to get deployed, backed by helicopters along Iraq and Turkey's border. As we can see, see, the fighters from the Kurdistan Workers' Party have intense activities here. Yesterday, Turkey convened a high-level meeting between leaders from political and military institutions to discuss the measures that will be taken to stop the escalation of Kurdish attacks, which killed 12 soldiers from the Turkish army in two days. The commander of the army talked about the surveillance operation carried out by drones over Iraq to watch the Kurdish fighters. Ankara brought the drones from Tel Aviv to observe the fighters' activities. Two days ago, Ankara targeted the fighters with airstrikes and land attacks in villages in northern Iraq. Prime Minister Netanyahu came to the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee today to explain the government decision to lift the civilian blockade on Gaza. The Prime Minister said that over time, the effectiveness of the severe restrictions on the importation of food and other goods diminished, while at the same time they provided Hamas with an important propaganda tool, a tool, the Prime Minister said, which they now no longer possess. Netanyahu told the committee that in the wake of his policy change, he expects the international community to show greater understanding of Israel's legitimate security needs. The Israeli security cabinet decided to give a green light to all civilian products to enter the Gaza Strip. And from now on, all items, all goods, can enter the Gaza Strip, except those weapons and other military items, dual-use items, that can be used by the Hamas military machine. Opposition leader Tzipi Livni bitterly criticized Netanyahu's policies, charging that his, quote, blindness had led to Israel's unprecedented isolation in the world. In the course of today's discussion, Netanyahu made a startling revelation. He told the committee that his security guards have banned him from traveling on Highway 443. Parts of that highway, which links Jerusalem with the Modi'in area, were recently opened to Palestinian traffic under orders from the High Court of Justice. Well, just hours after Israel announced the easing of restrictions on goods allowed into Gaza, the terrorists said thank you by firing a Qassam rocket into the western Negev. The Qassam rocket exploded in the Ashkelon Regional Council. The color red alert system was activated, giving residents time to seek shelter. There were no reports of injury or damage. Lebanon has given its blessing to another Gaza-bound aid ship. Transportation Minister Razi Aridi authorized the vessel to sail from Tripoli to Cyprus before it attempts to run the Gaza blockade. Lebanese law prohibits ships sailing directly from Lebanese ports to what they call ports under Israeli occupation. 25 European activists, including some parliament members, along with dozens of journalists, are said to be aboard the vessel. I already said another boat would have to undergo an inspection before it is allowed to depart Tripoli. Earlier, Israel warned Lebanon through diplomatic channels that it reserves the right to stop any vessel attempting to violate the blockade of the Hamas-run territory. Jerusalem mayor Nir Barkat is moving ahead with a construction project that would involve raising 22 Palestinian homes in the Al-Bustan neighborhood of Silwan. Plans for the development have been in the works for over a year, but a delay was ordered after requested for four months ago by Prime Minister Netanyahu. The proposal is expected to gain approval by the municipality's local planning and construction committee. Barkat said the project will provide a much-needed facelift to the vicinity, which Israel calls King's Garden. He said the 22 homes, which were illegally constructed, will be rebuilt legally on the periphery of the area. The eastern section of the green area, which includes 66 structures, will be completely rezoned as residential, and residents will then have the ability to apply for the retroactive legalization of their homes. Palestinians are claiming that the proposal to build a tourist center there is yet another effort by Israel to lay claim to eastern Jerusalem by cementing its presence there. Members of the Meretz faction are threatening to resign from the Barkat-led municipal coalition over the matter.
The humanitarian challenges facing the High Consultative Committee of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees and RUA were the focus of a discussion in Cairo. Member countries said that Israel is legally responsible for the rights of refugees. Our correspondent Sharif Fouad reports from Cairo. Finding a solution to the Palestinian plight is contingent on finding a fair solution to the refugees' problem. This is what dignitaries and representatives of international organizations gathering in Cairo concluded. This is the first such conference to be hosted by Egypt since UNRWA was founded nearly 60 years ago. The meeting was originally intended to discuss the global financial crisis and the humanitarian challenges facing the international agency operating in the occupied Palestinian territories and refugee camps abroad. Speakers at the UNRWA conference held Israel responsible for the shortcoming. Israel's responsibility for the refugees cannot be denied or ignored, no matter how much it tries to forget history. The participants called on donor countries to renew their support for UNRWA in order to help it complete its mission and close the deficit facing its branches. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is set to hold early elections in July 2010 for the presidency of UNRWA's consultative committee. The Saudi envoy said that his country will not hesitate to support the plight of the Palestinian refugees. The Saudi Development Fund has recently signed a memo of understanding with UNRWA. Under the terms of the agreement, Saudi Arabia is to pledge nearly 25 million U.S. dollars for the reconstruction of the old Nahir al-Barid refugee camp. UNRWA's High Commissioner has criticized the international community for failing to bring about a solution to end the Arab-Israeli conflict, which has negatively affected the humanitarian situation of the refugees. The closure of Gaza's borders has entered its fourth year in blatant defiance of the principles of international laws, causing great suffering to the civilian population. It has negatively affected all of Gaza in terms of poverty, unemployment and public services. UNRWA has pledged support to all countries hosting its operations, including Lebanon, Syria and Jordan. The world is still unable to see Israel as an occupying power, a power that has destroyed an entire nation and stolen its land, displacing millions of people in the diaspora. And those who remain in Palestine are facing death or expulsion. It's either a homeland without life or a life without homeland. The Palestinian ambassador to Lebanon said that Palestinian civil rights are merely humanitarian, not political. The issue of the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon was the main topic of discussion in a meeting between Palestinian Ambassador to Lebanon Abdullah Abdullah and the General Assembly of the March 14th Alliance. Abdullah said that Palestinian civil rights are merely humanitarian, not political. Palestinians in this country, once granted their civil, humanitarian or social rights, don't have any intention to become part of the country's political fabric. Palestinians are not demanding health rights or benefits from the Lebanese government. We are completely against that. The hosting nations are not responsible for our health and social well-being. Even the Palestinian National Authority in the West Bank and Gaza Strip is not obligated to provide health and social care for Palestinians living in refugee camps in the West Bank and Gaza. This is the responsibility of the UN, particularly its executive branch, UNRWA. There is no connection between the issue of Palestinian arms inside and outside the refugee camps and the granting of humanitarian and civil rights to the Palestinian people. The Lebanese state reserves the right to expand its sovereignty over all of Lebanon, including the Palestinian refugee camps. The March 14th alliance, during its conferences in 2008, 2009 and 2010, has reiterated its commitment to granting humanitarian and civil rights to the Palestinians. This issue requires engaging in dialogue and discussions related to the nature and scope of these rights. Coordinator of the General Assembly of the March 14th Alliance, Fadis Saad, confirmed that all political parties that engage in a confrontation with the PLO during the civil war have closed this painful chapter. It's day 62 in the BP Gulf spill, and the oil has now spread to an area the size of the state of Kansas. Tar balls have begun washing up on pristine Florida beaches, and resort owners report vacation reservations are way down, threatening a $57 billion a year tourist industry. 
4,600 boats and ships are on the Gulf battling the oil. The oil still keeps leaking despite some of it being retrieved by BP. And says BP, it's spent now $2 billion so far doing this and compensating the victims. It's being reported by the BBC that BP knew about the leak weeks before it triggered the blast that killed 11 rig workers, beginning the worst environmental catastrophe in U.S. history. The biggest fear really is that a lot of these whales and other large species, large creatures like marlin and tuna may be killed and were never seen. Um, big sharks, things like that, they could, be, they could be sinking to the bottom or eaten by other creatures uh, before we know what's going on out there. Another big worry now is hurricane season, which is just beginning. Experts are predicting an active season with at least 14 to 23 named storms, and many will undoubtedly roar into the Gulf. A hurricane rolling through there right now and hitting the panhandle of Florida or Louisiana coast would churn the oil up, drive it farther inland into the marshes, would remobilize oil that's under the surface that we're not seeing. There's oil on the bottom of the ocean right now that could be churned up by a, a big storm, and that really will amplify the impact of this problem exponentially. It's a, a pretty worst-case scenario at this point. The full economic impact of the spill is now being felt on the Gulf. President Obama's hand-picked administrator of a $20 billion BP disaster fund says that people are, quote, in desperate financial straits and need immediate relief. Many complain of too much red tape and delays. Meantime, here on K Street in Washington, home to America's most powerful lobbyists and public relations companies, BP is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to improve its sordid image with the American public. They've hired high-priced Washington lobbyists and consultants to fend off nine investigations and persuade Congress that BP is not evading responsibility for the disaster. It's going to be a difficult sell, but lobbyists with ties to both Republican and Democratic power brokers in Washington are now working for BP. Meanwhile, several oil companies have filed a lawsuit asking a federal judge to lift President Obama's six-month moratorium on new deepwater drilling projects in the Gulf of Mexico. Mike Kellerman, Press TV, Washington. The Brazilian foreign minister, a former graduate of the Vienna Diplomatic Academy, made a speech to ambassadors about Brazil and the New World Order. As an inseparable part of that new order, he pointed to the cooperation between Iran, Turkey and Brazil on the Tehran nuclear declaration signed in Iran on the 17th of May. In his address, Celso Amorim called the declaration an example of goodwill on the part of Iran for dialogue and cooperation. In my opinion, sanctions make things more difficult, not easier, but I don't think they make it impossible. Minister Amorim in Vienna for bilateral discussions with his Austrian counterpart Michael Spindelegger also stressed that the latest set of UN Security Council sanctions against Iran is, according to Brazil, not the way to resolve the tussles over Iran's nuclear program. Brazil and Turkey's vote against the new Security Council sanctions also indicates a big change in the global geopolitical climate, as according to the Brazilian foreign minister, these two rising powers oppose the existing world powers. A Syrian filmmaker is tirelessly working on his new TV series, Memory in the Flush, which is based on a book by the same title, written by Algerian author Ahlam Mustaghani. The TV series tells the story of the Algerian resistance to the French occupation. Our reporter, Bassam al-Qadiri, was in the studio where the TV series was filmed. This series starts with the French Revolution, but also includes the Palestinian suffering and pain. An important historic chapter in the modern Arab struggle against occupation was paid for by the resistance fighters who achieved an unequivocal victory. It is the Algerian revolution that lasted more than seven years and claimed the lives of more than one million and a half martyrs.
محطة تغنى بها الكثير من الكتاب والشعراء A chapter that was praised by many poets and authors as well as resistance fighters It was commemorated in poems, music and even in films Today it has reached the television screen represented by a dramatic series based on the book Zekrayat al-Jassad or Memory in the Flesh It was screen written by Syrian author Reim Hanna who was able to merge both the Algerian and Palestinian revolutions into one Arab vision through this work, we are trying to focus on the middle class and to reconsider the role of the middle class because it is the one that can achieve tangible changes in society. The Algerian revolution is part of the Arab world's history. Everybody knows it as the one and a half million martyr revolution. It was addressed in films, but for the first time we are now addressing it in a daring TV series. This is also the first time that we highlight the details. The intertwining of the Palestinian and Algerian revolutions was carefully done in order to address the pain of ordinary Arabs that continues today. I lived through the invasion and I experienced all kinds of difficult conditions. I also saw the Israeli warships and everything that took place. Of course, this work will personify the hero of the film in a realistic and serious manner. تدور أغلب أحداث المسلسل حول المناضل الجزائري خالد بن طوبال الذي يؤدي دوره الفنان جمال. The events of the series are centered on the Algerian freedom fighter Khaled bin Tobal, who is played by actor Jamal Suleiman. The character joins the Algerian revolutionaries and falls in love with a girl by the name of Hayat, played by Algerian actor Amal Shusha, who is the daughter of the Algerian freedom fighter that was killed in the revolution for. Independence. In real life, her father was the friend of Ben Tobal. The series, which will be aired during the month of Ramadan, will appeal to the endless pain of our Arab nation. Basam al Qadari, Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, Beirut. Joining us from Cairo is film critic Tariq Ash Shinawi. Tariq, do you think that modern Arab drama is able to really reflect history? In reality, we have many shortcomings in addressing our modern Arab history through drama. This doesn't only apply to the Algerian revolution, but also to the Egyptian one and all other revolutions. We have failed to present these revolutions to people through drama. We have also failed to do that with the Palestinian revolution and resistance. Despite these shortcomings, I have noticed that recently there have been attempts to take on significant historical events, such as the latest TV series about the American invasion of Iraq. Both American and Arab dramas address this issue. The Luxor Governorate won in the prestigious competition hosted by the Organization of Islamic Capitals and Cities for its project for the development of the Karnak Temple Plaza. The Governorate began executing the program's first phase two years ago. Its final phases were completed with the restoration of the splendid and magnificent pharaonic appearance of the Karnak temples. These are the Karnak temples in Luxor, which have also been known as the house of the Egyptian god Amun for more than 5,000 years. It is the largest historical site in the world that includes six temples covering 200 acres. This treasure used to be hiding behind the slums until modern development reached this area and discovered the historical site for the benefit of the world. As soon as we opened the chambers, we found items from 1920. As you can see, what the experts found inside was almost destroyed. Today, there are only three of them in the entire world. One of them existed here, and we restored it. The Karnak Temple Plaza development project, which cost 85 million Egyptian pounds, has increased the number of tourists. The temple's features have been brightened, and touring the plaza is now easy for the visitors. The commercial center, which was built in a modern architectural style, gives a new dimension to tourism in Luxor. I was here in 1972. I was here in 1972, and it wasn't this beautiful. Today, we can view the historical sites and observe the new features of the temples. I teach at the university. In... I teach engineering at the University of Arizona. 
I'm very impressed by the scale of this project in Karnak Plaza. I will talk to my students about it and also about the Sphinx. This plaza will also be used to display tourist programs to develop the site and preserve the discoveries of the Karnak temples. The final phase of the Karnak Temple Plaza development project includes connecting the temples to the Nile on one side and to the Holy lake on the other, which is how the landscape of the plaza used to be. After removing the slums and developing Karnak Plaza, it has become possible for you to stand in front of the east gate of the Karnak temples and look at the Hajib Sud temple to the west. This is what helped Luxor win second place in the Islamic cities and capitals contest two years in a row. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.